We are in section one, key concepts of the service configuration management. Section one is the longest of all the seven sections in this course. Section two, which is about value streams and processes is also a bit long, but not long as section one. The remaining sections are somewhat smaller than sections one and two. The exam questions from this section would be related to understanding the key concepts of the practice, which means there would be no application questions from this part of the course. We will have to understand the purpose of the practice, describe the practice success factors and key metrics, and also certain key terms and concepts such as configuration item, service configuration model, configuration item lifecycle model, configuration management system, configuration management database, baseline configuration, configuration verification, configuration inventory, and configuration audit. We begin with the very basic, which is the purpose of the practice. The purpose of the service configuration management practice is to ensure that accurate and reliable information about the configuration of services and the configuration items that support them is available when and where it is needed. This includes information on how configuration items are configured and the relationships between them. So this is a very information intense practice. That information has to be accurate and reliable. It is about the configuration of the services, the way the services are architectured and the relationship between the service components. The information should reflect all that and the information should be up to date and reliable. Organizations use resources such as systems, applications, people, contracts, etc., to create and deliver their products and services. These may belong to the organization or they may be available as part of another service that organization consumes. So this practice has to collect and manage a lot of information about several resources, hardware, software, networks, buildings, people, suppliers, products, services, and documentation. All these are known as configuration items. So let's look at the definition of the configuration item. It is any component that needs to be managed in order to deliver an IT service. Usefulness of the configuration information and the costs of obtaining and maintaining it are important. And uh, we have to recollect again that the main objective of this practice is to efficiently provide useful information to the organization. Therefore, some examples of configuration items could be certain applications, certain networks, systems, software licenses, because all of them need to be managed in order to deliver certain IT services. And there can be many other examples as well. Therefore, it is important that whatever resources the practice brings under its control, whatever components it brings under its control as configuration item, that should be defined by the usefulness of the information and the cost of obtaining and maintaining it. Therefore, it would be unnecessary to record and maintain information which is not of much use. Let us look at the benefits of this practice. This practice is an important element of service management. In fact, in some of my experiences, I had worked along with my colleagues to implement this service configuration management first, even before incident management or other practices. Sometimes the service desk takes more priority over this. Again, it depends on the organization's objectives, their positioning in the market, etc. So this practice is therefore beneficial for both the service provider and the service consumers. There are several benefits for the service provider. They can understand the risks and do better risk management because they understand the configuration items and the relationships between them. For example, they will know which application is running on which set of servers and what other components they are connected to. The service provider can do better planning and control of changes because they can do better impact assessment having understood the relationships between the service components involved in the change. And in a similar way, the provider can understand and manage the capacity, availability, and security of those IT services and components. 
because they have clear visibility of the information and the relationships between the components. They can also accurately allocate service costs because they have a clear view of the service uh, components and the CI is involved. Then uh, this leads to better understanding, planning and control of the service performance. They can create uh, reports by configuration item or by a set of configuration items or by location, etc. And uh, also when there are certain impacts occurring due to certain incident, they can do better cause and effect analysis, or there might be some errors uh, which have not resulted in incidents. They can even do proactive cause and effect analysis. And this improves the overall efficiency and incident um, efficiency of incident and problem management. Now for the service consumer, though the list is smaller here, there can be many, many other benefits as well. The consumer is able to have more realistic and accurate service level agreements because the provider would be more practical in the signing off of the agreements and the consumer also understands the service provider setup and uh, they also receive higher quality of IT services and uh, the consumer can have a better management of their own IT risks. So as mentioned earlier, the practice is an important element of the overall service management of any organization. And once again, this practice efficiently provides useful information to the organization. Next, we have the service configuration models. Uh, the practice of service configuration management involves identifying and documenting the relationships or connections between the configuration items. So this results in service configuration models. What are they? They describe or depict aspects of service architecture and relationships between the services and components. It is important to differentiate between the service configuration models and the configuration item life cycle models, which will come up a little later. This one is about the depiction of the architecture and the relationships between the services and the components. So uh, they may be designed, maintained and presented at high or functional levels or physical or digital levels as per the stakeholders needs. So it can be um, uh, shown as a, a picture and we'll see that as an example on the next slide. Now, these models are useful for impact analysis whenever there are some issues or incidents or known errors to be assessed. And, and for a similar reason, cause and effect analysis of those situations, risk analysis, cost allocation, availability analysis and planning. And we have seen that these are also some of the benefits for the service provider from this practice. Therefore, these models should be designed and maintained to meet the stakeholders' needs. There should also be as much automation as possible. In fact, this practice is a highly automated practice. It relies on the collection, maintenance, and control of large amounts of configuration item data. And uh, most of the times uh, requires building, maintaining, and presenting complex configuration models. The practice involves gathering data from multiple sources and uh, combining them or integrating them and presenting them in a meaningful way to stakeholders as per their requirements. And therefore, there are many specialized tools which are used in this practice um, uh, apart from monitoring, discovery, analytical, and record-keeping systems. And uh, this practice also integrates uh, its own records with uh, information from other practices such as IT asset management, incident management, change enablement, problem management, monitoring and event management, service request management, and other practices. Some configuration models are difficult or uh, may not be even possible to automate. Therefore, uh, they require manual data maintenance and relationship mapping, uh, such as user data, organization structures, and contracts with partners and suppliers. Of course, manual efforts will have their own costs. And also the manual uh, data has to be integrated with the other automated uh, means of uh, gathered data. And all these should be considered when the practice is being designed and improved. 